America's working class has been cheated. That is an assertion. Open border for NATO. Open no, that's, a, that's a Koch brothers proposal. Uh, and the Democrats jumped right on board with the corporatists. They got in bed with Wall Street, military industrial complex, the fossil fuels, Silicon Valley. And now look what happened to the country. We have the bigger, biggest income disparity since the Gilded Age. Bigger than that. There's more. Expanded trade has thrown the working class into much more competition than they experienced before trade with lower wage countries took off. can say is that as a country, we have to make a different set of choices because the choices we've made have hurt working people. Congressman, because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write, I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Hello, and welcome to another Institute for Sound Public Policy podcast. My name is Kevin Lynn, and I am the Executive Director of the Institute, as well as your host today. And today is Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, and I am delighted to have Michael Lind here today. And Michael is a columnist at Tablet, a former uh, academic at University of Texas, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, He's received his master's in international relations from Yale University, and he receives his JD from University of Texas Law School. And after serving as the assistant to the director of the U.S. State Department Center for the Study of Foreign Affairs, he went to work as an editor for a variety of national publications throughout the 1990s. And his writings have been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, foreign affairs, foreign policy, and most recently, and why I'm really excited to have you here today, Michael, is you're the author of a book, the book, Hell to Pay, How Suppression of Wages is Destroying America. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you for having me. Well, great. Uh, I thought to start things off, uh, we dive into uh, why... You describe the need for a living wage, and I'd like to ask you, why in the 21st century is that so elusive to so many Americans? Well, it's really kind of horrifying because the campaign for a living wage was central to organized labor in the 19th century and in the first half of the 20th century, and it was achieved largely during the New Deal era between the 1930s and the 1970s and 80s, in the last half century, uh, we've seen a massive regression in the bargaining power of wage earners. And uh, one of my goals in writing my book, Hell to Pay, is to uh, discredit the conventional theory that wages are, are low wages in America are the result of globalization or technological hmm. innovation, or these abstract impersonal forces. Uh, it's the whole story is really how uh, employer lobbies, working with uh, allies in both the Democratic and the Republican parties, have demolished one institution or rule after another uh, that bolstered working worker bargaining power over the last uh, fifty years. Interesting, because you. Talk about this, the big lie, you know, the notion that you're paid what you deserve is a, that the notion that you're paid what you deserve is really a myth, if not simply fallacious. Uh, what do you mean by that, Michael? Well, there are two theories about how wages are set. Uh, the older theory, which happens to be correct, it was shared by Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. These are not flaming leftists by any means. Right. The, the, way, the wage is set by the balance of bargaining power between the employer and the worker. The worker wants the highest wage possible, and the employer wants to minimize uh, the cost of wages, uh, which are the biggest cost of a company. Uh, and so when workers have strong bargaining power, they can demand higher wages. Uh, and when they have weak bargaining power, they have to take low wages. And that was the traditional theory. But in the 20th century, uh, the academic economists came up with this uh, very clever, uh, ingenious and utterly false theory 
that uh, whatever wage you are paid reflects your value to your employer on, on, on at that given moment. It's called the marginal revenue product or MRP theory. Uh, mm-hmm. It's total nonsense outside of the uh, the economics classroom uh, because uh, if it were really true that there was some sort of automatic uh, labor market mechanism setting wages based on your personal productivity and your contribution to the company, then your your wage should vary hour by hour during the day, right? Okay. So when you get tired and you start <laughs> slacking off, your wage should, you know, everyone should wear these little meters, right? You know, about your contribution to the productivity of the firm. Uh, and of course it's nonsense, but it's ideological nonsense uh, that is used so that uh, the business elite can say, uh, even while they're crushing the ability of workers to bargain for high, higher wages, they can say, oh, look, you know, we have no fingerprints. We had nothing to do with this. Uh, it's just uh, the workers lack skills. They lack human capital. And that's part of the big lie. So the story mm-hmm. is that uh, the only if you're paid poorly, it's your fault. You're not skilled enough. Uh, you need to go learn to code. Right. You need to become a tech worker. And as, as we can discuss, the tech workers get screwed over, too. Uh, but that's been the theory. Right. You know, if, if you're complaining about your wages as a janitor, then, you know, go to college and learn to code and move to the Bay Area and write software and found your own uh, startup. So this was this was the line of the neoliberal establishment from the 1990s. And it, and it is still the line, basically, that uh, the answer to low wages is not more bargaining power of workers through means like unions, through uh, immigration restriction, that's one tight labor markets, limits on offshoring, uh, contract clause revisions. So all of those things are irrelevant according to our bipartisan establishment. Uh, The only thing you can do to raise people's wages is give them more education. Interesting, because we do wanna get into the whole concept of learn to code uh, because as you know, I represent uh, U.S. tech workers here in the United States, uh, and we battle to prevent the the kind of job insecurity that has creeped into that career since the 1990s. Now, you had mentioned workers losing power. Uh, I'd like to get into some specifics on how they lose power, because I want to talk about unions, collective action, things like that. You know, my personal history uh, I grew up on a small farm, but my father was a flight engineer for Transworld Airlines. I mean, he was literally flying 747s with a high school education. Mm-hmm. And he was probably in my area. He was probably the third highest salary man in that area. And he was a union man the whole time that he was there. And I recall a couple times they struck. Yet today, professionals, like I was talking to a... Uh, pilot at American Airlines, and we, he was talking about the terrible wages and the rules where they only get paid once the engines turn on and all the other stuff they're not paid for. And I'm like, well, why don't you strike? Oh, we would never do that. Well, they used to, and they used to be quite effective in bettering their lot. So, Michael, what has happened to erode worker power? And uh, specifically, you had mentioned some things uh, captive meetings, salary bans, no poach agreements, arbitration. So I'd like to you know to talk about generally then some very specific things as to how union power, worker power has been diluted. Well, in general, the decline of organized labor in the private sector uh, is the most important cause of stagnant and low wages uh, in the private sector for private sector workers. If you look at The 1950s and 60s, about a third of private sector workers were unionized. It's fallen to 6% today in the U.S., which is lower than it was under Herbert Hoover before the New Deal in the 1920s, when unions were treated as illegal conspiracies much of the time. Uh Uh, So unlike in other Western democracies, uh, there's been some decline in union membership, but nothing like the complete near extinction of private sector uh, union membership in the US. Now, it's important to add that this is a result of two factors. One is just an endless onslaught by employers from the 1940s onwards. But the other factor was a design defect 
in the American uh, labor law, uh, with the exception of railroad workers, transit workers, and airline uh, workers, in interestingly enough, who are all covered by the 1926 Railway Labor Act. Uh, private uh -huh. sector workers in the U.S. are covered by the 1935 National Labor Relations Act. Is, Is that also part? referred to as the Wagner Act? Yes, the, the Wagner Act, after Senator uh -huh. Wagner of New York, who uh, pushed it. Uh, and the Wagner Act, unlike the Railway Labor Act, was deeply flawed because it uh, concentrates on enterprise bargaining rather than sectoral bargaining. Well, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, sectoral bargaining, which is common in Western uh, countries that have strong labor movements, means that uh, all of the employers in an industry negotiate with representatives of labor in that interest industry at the same time. And the resultant contracts bind all of the companies, not just one company. Under the uh -huh. enterprise system, which the United States has had, for most workers, not all, since the 1930s, uh, if you have a national corporation like Amazon or Starbucks, you can only unionize one establishment at a time. Okay, so you have to, you can't unionize Starbucks overnight. You have to unionize each and every single Starbucks coffee house. You have wow. to unionize each and every uh, Amazon warehouse. So that in itself, uh, it wasn't a big problem in the late 1940s and early 1950s, where many Americans worked for huge manufacturing firms. And there weren't many of them. You know, there were the big three auto firms. You know, there were a, a couple of big steel firms and so on. But in today's economy, when most workers are service sector workers, often in fairly small uh, companies or in small establishments of national companies, like Starbucks and Amazon, uh, it, it's it's very easy uh, for companies to defeat collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. Now, can you get into, uh, you use the term captive meetings. What is that? Well, this is a technique to deter unionization under the National Labor Relations Act, where under federal law, employers are allowed to gather all the workers in the company and say, well, it's your legal right to unionize but all of these terrible things will go out of happen. You know, we'll we'll uh, lose all our profits. You'll be unemployed. You know, you're going to end up on welfare, et cetera, et cetera. So go ahead, vote for the union if you want. <laughs> right? And this is perfectly legal uh, uh, tactic. Uh, or and uh, you know, there there are other devious tactics that employers use to deter unionization under our existing system. One which is new uh, as a result of all of the diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff. Right. Uh, it's mm -hmm. employers create race and gender-based employee affinity groups. Okay. So you, you bring together all your employees and then you divide them. The non-Hispanic white males go over here. The Asian and Pacific Islander uh, women go over here. Uh, and you just just carve them up, uh, depend, which is what multiculturalism and DEI does. I mean, it's basically a divisive thing. Uh, and so then they're supposed to talk in their little groups about how much they have in common uh, as non-Hispanic whites or as Hispanics or, you know, as women or as non-binary people or whatever. Uh, and of course, this is a great divide and rule tactic by management uh, because it makes people focus on how different they are from their fellow workers, as opposed to the salient fact that they're all workers for the same company and they share certain basic interests as employees, regardless of race, gender, and sexual orientation. Yeah, and that, I see that in, in the broader social spectrum as well. Uh, for instance, uh, when I lived in California, we were fighting back uh, Walmart, uh, had really changed uh, their tactics and really upped their game when they were moving into a community. Like they wouldn't, they would do a lease, a lease agreement under a fictitious name, and only when they had applied for like a liquor permit or something would they then announce, "Oh, Walmart's moving in." And we would try to push back, but it was so hard to organize uh, communities that were uh, really of very different ethnic 
uh, backgrounds, uh, and not just ethnic, but new arrivals, like immigrants that were new arrivals, because Walmart would then put out all this literature, for instance, in Spanish, where you had a large Hispanic community saying, oh, you're about to get cheap food and everything. And we're trying to say, no, no, they're going to give us low wages. They're going to put the giant that are unionized. Mm -hmm. They're going to put them out of business. And this is what will happen. And that never gets communicated well. But also just in a you know, a fellow by the name of Robert Putnam, a uh, academic, uh, created a paper and it was called E Pluribus Unum, Diversity and Community in the 21st Century. And they did it a really uh, advanced study. They used about, there were about 30,000 participants in their surveys. They were longitudinal, cross-sectional. And what they found was the diversity doesn't help in terms of getting people to one, uh, come together, share common goals and values, and it actually hinders uh, collective action and bringing the community together. People just feel uh, more atomized. So on a broader social spectrum, that seems to be happen that happens as well. And certainly these guys seem to have figured that out. Well, this is nothing new. In the 19th century, uh, in my book, Helga Bay, I quote uh, corporate uh, managers saying they deliberately bring, in those days, different European ethnic groups together, Swedes and Germans and Poles, and mix them up because these new immigrants have very little in common and they're unlikely to work together uh, to unionize. Uh, a lot of historians believe that the cutoff of uh, U.S. immigration, mass immigration in the 1920s, which unfortunately was done in a very racist way, privileging Northwestern Europeans mm -hmm. uh, at the expense of, of Italians and Jews and, and Slavs. Completely uh, excluding say, Chinese. Yeah, and completely Japanese. excluding mm -hmm. Asians. But notwithstanding the fact that it was racist, uh, arguably it promoted a unionization and solidarity a generation later because uh, the children of immigrants and my own uh, Swedish ancestors came in that period in the late 19th century, who, you know, saw themselves basically as a diaspora of a foreign country, their children grew up as cultural Americans and spoke English as their native language and intermarried with each other to the extent that by the 1970s, Americans of mixed European national descents outnumbered so-called pure, you know, Italian Americans or Polish Americans or German Americans or Irish Americans. So uh, it's not a matter of race, but it's more of a matter of culture. If uh, uh, people are in communities which uh, see the others and sometimes see the American majority as something really uh, uh, alien and different, uh, it's much less likely that they will collaborate on, on uh, cross-ethnic and cross-racial uh, uh, policies like uh, unionization. Mm -hmm. it's certainly, it, it just, and again, the corporate, as you pointed out, the, uh, the corporate corporations have figured out how to very effectively divide and conquer us. Uh, there's other things you talked about, uh, salary bans, for instance. Like, now this, this I is worked at Robert Half, and we would publish okay. our salaries. I worked for Robert Half for a year. It was one of the worst working experiences of my life. But we would publish the salary uh, annual salary guide. Yeah, this is fascinating because it's in fact a employer cartel to uh, lower the bargaining power of workers by forbidding them from getting raises uh, if they're at the top of one of their salary bands, unless they change their classification. Uh, and as you know, from your experience, uh, uh, it's illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act for companies to ask each other, what are you paying? Why don't we all set a maximum amount <laughs> for receptionists? Right. And let's come up with a maximum amount, uh, folks, you know, for the engineers and the vice presidents. And that way, if they uh, threaten, you know, to go to the, one of the, the uh, our other companies, uh, if if they don't get a raise, then we'll just say, sorry, we all agree. You're not going to make, you know, any more money than this. All of those. It's, a, it's a very soft way to collude. And they use third parties to do that, to arrive at these salary conclusions. 
yeah, they, they hire consulting firms, for example, uh, to skirt antitrust law. So they can't ask each other directly, what are you paying your staff? But they can ask a consulting firm and they can say like, well, in general, you know, this is the salary band. So, but but the whole point of it is to destroy the bargaining power of, of the employees in a firm. And, and it's very amusing. I've read this literature. You have a big crisis when you have a very talented employee who's already being paid at the top of the salary band, right? And according to the consultants, uh, under no circumstances can you uh, give that person a raise. It will destroy the whole salary band system. Uh, the only thing you can do is to move that employee into a higher, different rank. You have to reclassify them. Uh, or you can give them like a bonus instead of a raise or something, because otherwise this entire cartel within that industry uh, designed to suppress the wages of every worker in the industry to the benefit of every firm in the industry, the whole cartel would collapse if you can just start rewarding talented employees if as you see fit. Right. And you had mentioned there's another practice that's much more aggressive, uh, no poach uh, yeah, no is another poach tactic. Agreements, no poach agreements are completely illegal, unlike uh, uh, salary bans, which are technically illegal, but they're tolerated. Uh, no poach agreement is another kind of employer cartel against workers, where the, the uh, firms in an industry agree that they will not hire anybody who has worked for another firm in the industry. Uh, we saw the classic example of this was uh, Steve Jobs at Apple, uh, mm -hmm. Google, uh, uh, various other tech firms and, and uh, media and entertainment firms in the 2000s uh, had this massive conspiracy uh, of a no poach agreement uh, against their own workers who were fairly well paid professionals, but they just didn't want to pay them anymore. Uh, and so it's basically a blacklist so that you know, if you worked for Apple uh, and then you said, well, you didn't give me a raise, so I'm going to go to work for Google, you submit your application and Google rejects you. So then you go work for, you know, another tech firm, they reject you and they never tell you why they reject you. Well, you're rejected because you worked for one of their rivals, which seems perverse. I know. Right. Why wouldn't you lure the best talent uh, from your rivals? And the answer is, uh, once you start doing that, then all of the workers are going to start bidding up their wages. So we're just and isn't there present. there's an aspect to this, isn't there, Michael? Outside of wage and salary, it's. Uh, I'll, and I'll give you an example. I was it was I was in Orange County, California, at, in Irvine at a tech transfer conference in the late nineties, and this guy got up to talk about how we do tech transfer. He says we call it sneaker net. One day you're working at company A. And then you're working at company B, you take what's between your ears with you and voila. So don't they, in fact, you know, create monopsonies, monopolies by this practice as well? Oh, of course, a monopsony is when there's a single buyer uh, and that undermines uh, the sellers, in this case, the sellers of labor. So so the no poach agreements, the uh, uh, non-competes, uh, these are all aspects of firms, they're really doing what workers do when they unionize, right? So when workers unionize, uh, they present a united front trying to sell their labor to different companies. Uh, so through these uh, tactics like salary bans and non-competes and no poach agreements, all of the firms in a, in a field or an industry are secretly uniting to present a united front uh, to maximize their bargaining power. Uh, against individual workers in most cases, because most of these, for example, in the Silicon Valley, you know, Hollywood stuff, these these were largely not unionized workers. They were tech professionals and, and they're reasonably affluent, but they couldn't get raises and they didn't know why. Right. right. And this is actually, I'd like to kind of segue. It's a little earlier than I had hoped to, but uh, we look at the, preponderance of H-1B visa workers in Silicon Valley among not just the FANGs, but now in 
like SoCal Edison, you look at an IT shop, it's all uh, H-1B. These, they're, the work has all been outsourced to H-1B visa dependent companies like Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, my old alma mater, Ernst & Young. And these are workers that aren't at the end of the day, whether they're at one of the, uh, a consulting firm or they're working at Google or Facebook, in a way, you had used a great term, and we like to use it as well, called indentured servants. Because in a way, you know, they, unlike with salary and no poach agreements, these workers, these H-1B visa workers aren't going to go anywhere. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that's done? And this is just another tool to not just suppress wages, but also suppress uh, native labor. Yeah, the fundamental right of free labor is the right to quit your job and get another job in the same industry and even in the same country. And that is denied to what these so-called guest workers. They're called guest workers like it's a the U.S. is a B&B and they're tourists and all <laughs> that. They're, they're indentured servants. I mean, they're one step above slaves, uh, even if they're well paid. Uh, they're 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 not free labor. They are bound uh, to their employers, uh, and if they quit their sponsors, who may be a particular employer like Apple or Google or J.P. Morgan, but it may also be uh, one of these body shops. Many of them are Indian labor contractors. Uh, they cannot quit their job with and seek another job in the United States without the permission of their sponsor. Uh, so. Naturally, this makes them, and I've known a number of H-1Bs, they've been terribly exploited uh, by the sponsors and by the firms they work for. Uh, even if they're well paid, there's more to a, a good job than good money. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, like independence, there's the ability to protest. If you're uh -huh. totally de dependent on your sponsor in the or the employer, uh, and you actually literally have to leave the United States, uh, if you quit your job, uh, then the employer can treat you terribly and you're not going to protest, right? You know, you're not, you have no recourse. Uh, so given the choice of two employees, both, let's say they're well-paid, they're both making $100,000. One can say, one is a U.S. citizen uh, or else a, a legal permanent resident, a legal immigrant with complete economic rights, uh, the U.S. citizen or the legal permanent resident can say, take this job and shove it. You're treating me poorly. I'm going to go uh, get another job where they treat me better and pay better uh, here in this country, <laughs> in North America. Right. right? Uh, and then you have another worker who's paid $100,000, same skills, who can't quit without leaving the country. So there's this element of power there. It's not just money. And Adam Smith in the wealth of nations, he was not a fan of businessmen, Adam Smith, and capitalists. Uh, he, he, he was sympathetic to workers and to farmers rather than- And certainly his second book, it really he seemed to like look at all the ills and everything and yeah, the, the, make the some prescriptions. Of, right, right. The theory of moral sentiments. Uh, but in the wealth of nations, uh, Smith says, uh, most employers would prefer slaves to paid workers. And so why is that? And Smith says, because regardless of the economic benefits of paid labor, uh, masters, that was the term for bosses in his day, uh -huh. uh, it's in the nature of, uh, it's in human nature to want to dominate other people. He actually had a psychological explanation. And I saw this up front one time. I was at a huh. conference with a young 30-something tech CEO uh, from uh, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and... Uh, he said, well, we pulled out of Europe because in Europe you have to negotiate with the unions. Uh, so we're doing everything in China now. Uh, and so I said, but but why? And he said, because in China, they don't talk back. The workers do whatever you tell them to. But in Europe, you actually have to negotiate hours and right. wages and things. And this was, I'm sure this individual what was considered himself a progressive Democrat was worried about climate change, you know, supported gay rights and trans rights and all of that. Uh, but he had that slave master mentality, frankly, 
right? That I want to be the unquestioned autocrat in my business. Uh, okay. And no one can interfere with my discretionary power. Interesting. Uh, I'd like to segue now, uh, since we were talking about the H-1B visas, which is a, as you, it's a, it's an employment visa. I'd like to go more broad on the immigration front uh, because it's complex. We have legal immigration. We have illegal immigration. We have a whole slew of employment visas from ag workers up to our O visa, which is people who are geniuses or uh, artists uh, in general. And then I'd like to start really narrow looking at those three different areas. What are your thoughts on immigration and how does this also factor into wage suppression? Well, of course it does. Uh, we see that going on now where as a result of the uh, supply side uh, shock, uh, the the companies did not expect to open up as quickly uh, as they did after the end of COVID. Uh, for a brief period in the last couple of years, in some areas, not all workers uh, have had bargaining power, uh, have been able to use tight labor markets uh, to bid up wages. So what is the universal cry of business and of the uh, major media? We need more immigration to reduce inflation. Well, how does more immigration reduce inflation? By reducing wages, right? Right. And uh, the thing, isn't it amazing, Michael? Uh, what they're, you know, here you have an, and I want to talk to you, get really into your thoughts on economists in general and specifically and in particular. Uh, but at one hand, they'll say, oh my gosh, we, need more immigrants because they improve productivity they improve the standard of living they then on the other hand they're saying oh no uh we need more immigrants because wages are getting out of hand and like you said workers are beginning to bargain uh this is this is amazing to me. I just I I roll not only roll my eyes I probably do backflips when I hear and see this. Well, uh, the fact is, you know, you, you you get just simple dishonesty. And I say this, I've been a journalist at the New Yorker and Harper's and uh, uh, at the New Republic. Uh, uh, the, the media constantly repeats the falsehood that immigration, uh, and let's just look at unskilled immigration, has no effect on wages. And they say all economists and all studies agree. You just read this in op-eds op and in editorials. As you know, the National Academy of Sciences did two reports where they looked at all of the scholarly literature on immigration, one in 1996 and one in 2006. And they right. concluded that low wage, that unskilled immigration lowers wages for unskilled workers. Uh, and then they kind of prettied it up by saying, according to our mathematical model, which is based on equilibrium. It's just a, an assumption. It's not a fact. Uh, over over twenty or thirty or forty years, things will work out. But but you know the headline should have been, you know the definitive studies of the National Academy of Sciences prove that uh, um, unskilled immigration lowers the wages of unskilled competitors who are citizen workers or uh, 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 legal immigrants who lack skills. Other studies have shown this. The Dallas Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, economist and vice chair uh, uh, Pia Orenius, who's by no means a conservative or nativist, uh, did a study that showed that states which uh, crack down on employers of illegal immigrants, the major beneficiaries in the years that followed were Mexican Americans who were citizens or legal immigrants. So, the, so when the the establishment pundits like Noah Smith and Matthew Iglesias uh -huh. uh, and the, the New York Times editorial page say economists have shown that there's no effect on wages. I mean, they literally either they are ignorant of the scholarship or they, they're simply lying. And what's more, they are contradicting themselves because sometimes the same people say, A, immigration has no effect on wages and B, without immigration, prices will go up. 
Well, those yeah. are contradictory <laughs> statements because the only reason one, one is inflationary, one is deflationary. What is yeah. it, guys? Yeah. <laughs> so how can prices go up if wages uh, don't go up in, in, a, in a tight labor market without additional immigration? But this is just, look, it's power. It's raw power. Uh, and uh, the United States, and, and I'm 61, and, and uh, in my lifetime, uh, what has happened is the concentration of power. And I talk about this in my earlier book, before my present book, uh, Hell to Pay, how the suppression of wages is destroying America. I, in 2020, I published The New Class War, uh, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. Uh, and we have seen the breakdown of the local political parties, the trade unions, and even the religious congregations that used to represent working class people and their interests uh, between elections and in the workplace and, and in other places. So the country has become much more of an oligarchy now, and you see it, where there is one issue after another, and you know, immigration and wages are just an example. Uh, up to the late 1990s, as you recall, you could have debates about this. Uh, now it's just been shut down. Uh, everyone from the left of the Democrats to the right of the, except for the populist right of the Republican Party. Right. But the main which, which right strangely, has, it's completely flipped. You, the, the values of the populist right and what they're striving for are all the things the populist left strove for at the turn of the 18th and 19th century. <laughs> well, even, even as late as, as the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, yes. So, for example, uh, the two Democratic presidents, Carter and Clinton, had two big commissions on uh, immigration reform that were were tilted towards labor, towards organized labor. Right. You the had Hesper mentioned commission and the Jordan Commission. Right. Because you had mentioned the National Science Foundation study in 96, which was part of the Jordan Commission, wasn't it? That was a study. I, it may have originated with that, but uh, the point is the Hesburgh Commission appointed by Carter and the Jordan Commission uh, appointed by Clinton both recommended uh, crackdown on illegal immigration, uh, punishing employers of illegal immigrants. The, the E-Verify system developed as a result of one of the recommendations of the Jordan Commission in the 90s, uh, uh, having a universal a uh, foolproof identity card to prevent foreign nationals from uh, getting jobs uh, and so on. Now, these were were centrist and liberal proposals uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, as you recall. Uh, right. The people who opposed them, there were two groups. Uh, uh, there were libertarians who blessed their hearts. They're sincere little ideologues. They don't believe in countries. They don't believe in nation states. They just want, you know, unimpeded flows of labor and capital around right. the world. And the other, it was just cheap labor business lobbies, mainly agribusiness and a few others. Uh, so what has happened uh, so that what used to be the, the, so for example, like Trump's proposals on immigration were basically those of Democrats in the 1990s and 1980s, uh, even as late as uh, 2006. Then Senators Barack Obama uh, and Hillary Clinton voted for 200 miles of heavy duty security fencing along the Southwest border, right? Uh, so, so what has this changed? Well, the reason is the constituencies and their views have not changed. Uh -huh. the parties have flipped. The parties have flipped membership. Uh, so today's Republican Party, if you look at who votes for them, they're based in New England and the Middle West and the, the West Coast. The richest Americans now are Democrats. Uh, and working class Americans are uh, the white Americans, but increasingly working class Hispanic Americans and some black Americans are voting Republicans. So the Republicans uh, who used to be the Northeastern West Coast upper class party have traded places with the uh, Democrats who from uh, FDR up until really up until uh, Clinton uh -huh. were the white working class Southern and Midwestern party. Uh, and uh, ironically, uh, if you go back as I've done and look at who voted for Franklin Roosevelt, 
the professionals and the the rich people voted against Roosevelt all four terms. Um, Interesting. He, he he did well among uh, the college graduates. All voted against Roosevelt. In fact, up until the 1990s, most college graduates were. Uh, it seems hard to believe now, but they were Republicans. Democrats did not get the college uh, vote. Uh, Is and, that and so FDR. And let me just finish. So FDR, mm -hmm. you'll you'll enjoy this. So he did well among high school graduates. Uh, you know who who he did best with the, in all four of his oh. terms? Graduates of the sixth grade, like Jethro <laughs> Bodine in the, in the Beverly Hillbillies. If you if you were a sixth grade graduate, you were a New Dealer. You were for FDR. You were for the Democrats, right? <laughs> Too funny. My gosh, uh, you know it's it's interesting because I, I look at at this the, this flipping uh, of the two, and you had mentioned this change that happened po really post World War II, and in your book you talk about credentialization, and interestingly enough, Jane Jacobs, before, her last book before she passed away, was called The Coming Dark Age, and she devoted a chapter to this. And I'm thinking, is that because prior to, and looking at how you said people with college educations were voting, is that because post -world, college education for the masses is a post-World War II phenomenon? Whereas prior to that, you know, I look at, again, at my family's history, my father, who I'd mentioned earlier, they grew up in abject poverty in the coal mine regions of Pennsylvania. And my father was an artist. He flew. Uh, t uh, he flew for Transworld Airlines. He could take apart anything from a jet engine to a lawnmower, and yet it was his brother that the nuns thought would make it out of the coal mines and actually go to college. Whereas today, and I wonder if it gets into these issues with de you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and people's ability to be sold. A a bill of goods that's not necessarily good for them. Uh, do, is this have to? Does this have to do with what happened to the education system after World War II? I don't think so. So the GI Bill, uh, and then even in the '60s, uh, Pell grants and student loans and so on, they increased the supply side of mm -hmm. higher education. But the big uptake happens a generation or so later. So I think you have to look at the demand for college diplomas. And what I show in my book, Hell to Pay, is that the collapse of unions uh, because of various factors, including uh, movement to the anti-right to, you know, the white right to work states, the anti-labor states of the Sun Belt and then offshore to China mm -hmm. and Mexico. But the collapse of unions precedes the explosion of higher education. Uh, and I also show in my book, Hell to Pay, that uh, one response to the decline of union membership and getting you a higher wage has been the growth of two kinds of credentials. One is the college diploma, initially the bachelor's degree, but now that you're getting nearly four out of 10 Americans getting BAs, it, they're just becoming worthless. It's like a high school diploma. Uh -huh. So now you have to have a master's or an MBA or a professional degree. Uh, to, to get a higher uh, salary. The other one is occupational licensing. And there's been this explosion of occupational mm. licensing at the same time as the growth of college credentialing. So all of you can find all kinds of ridiculous examples like florists now have to go through these three-year trainings and all of this. Now, from the point of view of these workers, it's perfectly rational because occupational licensing creates a cartel. Uh, and it, it by excluding people who would be perfectly good florists, you know, they just can't pass the state florist test, which is ridiculously hard. Uh, then those who do pass the test and get the credential have higher wages just because they have a, they've created a tight labor market for themselves. Now the, this is having cartels in both bachelor's degrees and uh, occupational licensing that don't require college are, are educational credentials. Uh, they work by excluding competitors. 
Uh, that's the opposite of organized labor. Organized labor includes people. Right? Interesting ideally, distinction. Ideally, unions would include everybody, uh-huh. right? I mean, that was the goal of the IWW, the International Workers of the World, one big union. Uh, so, so, if, and uh, again, I cite studies in my book, Hell to Pay, showing that the premium that you get in wages, if you have, let's say, a florist license, or a BA uh, is similar, and this is not my original work, I'm just well documented in the scholarship, but you get a similar premium to union membership in the 1950s and 1960s. So in answer to your question, I think that if people had the option of graduating from high school, joining a union, and thanks to the union, getting paid well and you know starting a family, having a home, then in that case, I think that the demand uh, for college diplomas, and also for a lot of these occupational licenses, would, would just collapse. I, I, you know, speaking personally, you and I are the same age. And I don't know if you recall this. I went in the Army a couple of days after I graduated from high school, but I didn't have to. There were plenty of jobs available to me. There was, like where I live, there were several manufacturers, large ones, Olean Tile, Fasson. Do a few years there through some connections, get on with Bethlehem Steel. You know, that's 30 years of almost guaranteed work, so long as you showed up. We had options then, and those options I don't think exist, do they? No, and and uh, the corporate world has restructured itself to deny those options in the United States. So what you can do if, if you're a, in a globally traded industry, like manufacturing, then you offshore production to cheap labor or unfree labor in some other country. And you just keep the headquarters here and maybe some of the R&D, but a lot of them are offshoring the R&D as well. But what if you're in a non-traded domestic service sector industry like nursing care or janitorial? Uh, Well, you can still uh, lower your labor costs by uh, firing all of your in-house janitors and then rehiring them as contractors because under US labor law, uh, the company doesn't have to provide all these benefits uh, and and, uh, isn't bound by all of the labor laws with outside contractors. So then the contracting company can then fire the janitor a second time and rehire the janitor as an individual contractor, okay? So now the janitor who used to like have a 30 year career in a big company uh, is now one of several is now uh, technically a self-employed entrepreneurial capitalist. Interesting. Selling (laughs) selling his or her labor to. You are in charge of your destiny. (laughs) Yes. All the freedom in the world. Well, it's like, remember all the propaganda a few years ago about gig workers? Oh, Uh, right. They're self-employed, they're exploring their dreams, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the contract workers is what they are and the growth of contract labor uh, is a result of uh, employers trying to avoid labor regulations and unions and uh, uh, benefits and paid vacations and things. Amazing, and and we see that. And you had talked about a, a lower skilled worker, like a janitor. But we see that in higher skilled. Uh, we saw that you mentioned Disney, where they outsourced all of their IT uh, to an H-1B visa dependent company, and and then at the same, then very similarly, you have examples like SoCal Edison, where they rebadge their employees, and uh, also CSX, uh, they rebadge their whole IT department. We had talked about, I know I have a nephew who works for the railroads and he he's covered under, you had mentioned, was it, it was called the Railroad Act of? Railway and Labor Act, yes. Railway and Labor Act. And I mean, even his wife gets a pension. I mean, it, it's, yeah. a, it's brilliant, the protections, but what they did was this class of workers, they simply rebadged them to an H-1B visa dependent consulting firm. And so like you said, they don't have to pay the benefits, uh, the overtime, all and 
all those other ish things that go with being an employer, that employer-employee relationship. So it's happening across the spectrum, Michael. And um, well, well, why, we're running why, why a little. Would it, why go wouldn't ahead. a company do this? Uh, there are three <laughs> groups that have a claim on the profits of a private corporation: hmm. the shareholders, the managers, and the workers. The less you pay your workers, the more of the profits there are to be shared among the managers and the shareholders. And so even, uh, do you think that even these large uh, funds like Vanguard and others that uh, invest heavily in publicly traded companies, do you think they also help to drive these decisions of the managers of the companies? Well, there's a debate about that. So uh, it's widely believed that pressure from investors like these, these mutual funds and Wall Street are forcing corporations to do all of this. I myself do not believe this because most large corporations, uh, the management is essentially independent of the ever fluctuating number of shareholders and even of mutual funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so there may be cases of that, but I think in a lot of cases, like your basic CEO of a large corporation in the US appoints the board Basically, the board is puppets and they, you know, uh, uh, automatically vote whatever salary the CEO wants. So uh, if you go back to uh, Adolf Burley, uh, who wrote the classic book on the managerial corporation in the 1930s, hmm. he predicted that under managerial capitalism, in which the managers are a different group from the shareholders, the managers could simply run amok and loot the corporation. Because if you have 100,000 shareholders, and many of them, if they're invested in mutual funds, have no idea what companies they own. I'm invested in Vanguard. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what companies I own, an infinitesimal sliver of, right? So, you know, it may be true in some cases that financialization of Wall Street is doing this. But I think in a lot of others, uh, the managers essentially... Uh, they're irresponsible. They're not accountable to the shareholders. They're not accountable to the workers. Uh, and they're just enriching themselves at the expense of the corporation. You see this with stock buybacks, right? Mm, right. So, yeah, that, that may sh help shareholders by driving up the price. But since the 1980s, uh, managers have been uh, compensated with uh, shares and not just salaries. So in the old days when that was illegal, uh, we didn't have stock backs, buybacks. It was illegal in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, you're, the only way you got paid if you were a CEO was if your company was profitable uh, and you got your salary, right? With stock buybacks, uh, most of your income actually comes from the stocks in the company you own. So if you buy back stock driving up the price, you're literally enriching yourself uh, and no the company doesn't benefit. You're not investing in new machinery. You're not doing R&D. You're not doing marketing. You're not doing sales. You're just boosting your income before you quit as CEO and go play golf in La Jolla, California. And this is even beyond, you know, short term versus long term, because people will say, well, the problem is everyone's focused on the next quarter. What you're saying is these guys are literally sabotaging their companies. Short term, long term, doesn't matter. They're going to leave with, with a lot of money, a lot of loot. Yeah. So if you look at the glory days of American industrial capitalism, the founders were often engineers, you know, Chrysler and Ford and so on. They were mechanics. Uh, and But what happened in the 1960s was uh -huh. this founding generation of engineer CEOs was replaced by CFOs, by chief financial officers. Uh, and uh, uh, they viewed companies not as firms creating a particular high quality good or service, but as a source of cash. It's just a cash cow. Uh, and that's when you began to see these uh, conglomerates like WR Grace, which started off, I think it's like an oil drilling company. Uh -huh. But they ended up owning Little Debbie snack cakes, you know, Mexican dog racing is just uh, so I think we have a new conglomerate problem with Alphabet, the successor to Google and, uh -huh. and with Amazon. So Amazon owns doorbell companies. And now Amazon is doing television, right, with Lord of the Rings. Uh, right. And Alphabet owns all of these unrelated things. And there's, there's just from the point, and I'm pro-business, I believe in dynamic industrial capitalism. 
there's no way you can have the expertise to understand all of these different lines of business simultaneously, right? Uh, you know, Alphabet cannot, whoever's running Alphabet doesn't understand both search engines and Android phones and uh, self-driving vehicles. You know, Jeff Bezos does not understand the doorbell business and Whole Foods and television, right? So these are, what is happening is you have, it's hard to avoid the kind of vampire capitalist imagery, but basically they have these straws that they stick in different unrelated industries and they're kind of sucking blood, like, you know, sucking money out of these uh, companies. Uh, so the antitrusters are worried about the uh, uh, lack of competition. Uh, I think there's, it's inevitable you're going to get big firms. I'm not a big fan of, of radical antitrust. My problem is simply competence. Uh, uh -huh. There's no way that these conglomerate firms uh, can be competent in the long run. Uh, and if they're run by people with degrees in finance instead of by engineers, then forget about it. Interesting. Uh, we're coming up on an hour and we've gone on a lot of awesome rabbit holes in this. And I, I, I'm really enjoying this conversation, Michael, but there are some things I do want to get to in the interest of time, because I would like to get your thoughts on AI. And because at one point we have the, the people that are you know, don't seem to care about an open border and the impact that has on jobs or the offshoring and outsourcing and the impact that has on jobs. But they're decidedly concerned about the job loss from AI. I'd like to get your thoughts on AI and how that figures into the, you know, the, the job equation. Well, there have been panics about uh, mass unemployment as a result of technology beginning in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, and it has never happened uh -huh. since the beginning. There's never been mass technological unemployment. There has been incidental transitional employment when horse carriage drivers get replaced by automobiles and taxi drivers. Uh, but now this may happen in the future, but as of now, I'm skeptical. The only examples we have in the last 200 years of mass unemployment come from financial panics, where uh, it is spread by contagion uh -huh. through the financial system and particularly through the real estate mortgage system, which, which is, is critical. Uh, so, but you know, who knows? So maybe in the 21st or 22nd or 23rd century, there could be robotic caused uh, uh, unemployment. How would we deal with that? Well, uh, two ways. One is, uh, Productivity growth since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution has not come from training workers better. This whole mm. STEM skills thing is baloney. Uh, it has come from pairing workers who don't have to be geniuses with ever more advanced technology. So if the AI takes the form of complementing rather than replacing human labor, then you can have higher paid jobs and more advanced technology at the same time. But let's say just for a hypothetical that you're replacing a lot of labor. Uh, most people then immediately jump to this idea, oh, well then nobody will have a job and we'll have universal basic income and we'll just send people checks every week and they'll you know watch TV or have VR headsets or whatever. Uh, well, you know, there's things you can do before that. You can, as a result of increasing productivity, you can reduce the work week from five days to four days, and you can reduce the hours of work. And that was the vision of organized labor in the United States hmm. in the middle of the 20th century. That is uh, over time as a result of productivity growth, productivity growth would be shared, not necessarily in the form of higher wages, uh, but in the form of cheaper products. So that even if your wages weren't going up, you know, like you could afford computer video phones, right? You know, in the 21st century, mm. even if you're a worker, but also uh, more leisure time. Uh, and, you know, this has been destroyed uh, for political and, and uh, economic reasons by our, our social elite, but there's no reason why you have to jump 
from uh, underpaid workers to unemployed workers, you could have as a result of technological productivity growth and the right institutions have uh, ever shrinking work weeks with ever higher wages at the same time. Interesting. I appreciate that. Uh, I was at a conference the other week and uh, Peter Diamandis did a slide presentation and he talked a lot about AI. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I said, AI system defeats top doctors. And in China, this was done in tumor diagnosis, diagnosis competition. So AI correctly diagnosed 85% of the cases in 18 minutes. Neurologists achieved 64% accuracy in 50 minutes. So what he's getting at is, again, you know, AI seems to be able to do things better than a human in some respects. But what you're saying is this is really a tool then. A doctor can do better diagnos diagnostics and possibly a high-skilled doctor uh, with his four-year degree can treat more patients more effectively is what you're getting at. I, anything a machine can do, a machine should do and liberate human beings to do tasks that no longer have to be done, uh, particularly tedious and routine tasks. And frankly, scanning you know, biopsies is a tedious and routine task that maybe a machine can do better. Uh, so what jobs will remain? They will be the ones that cannot be automated, uh, largely personal care jobs, you know, nursing homes, uh, schools, uh, daycare, things like that. Uh, now, why can't you have a ratio of two nurses to one patient uh, instead of uh, 20 patients, you know, to one nurse? Uh, why can't you have classrooms in which instead of having 30 children to one teacher, you have three children to one teacher or one child to one teacher. Why can't every child have a personal tutor? So I don't think we're going to run out of uh, what are called high touch jobs, direct personal care jobs. But it is no doubt the case that uh, many professional workers whose uh, comparative advantage lies in like lawyers, like you go read books or look up cases online, uh, even if computer software can do that, you're out of a job. Uh, but that was true of John Henry competing with the jackhammer, you know, a hundred right. years ago. Uh, so, but, you know, nevertheless, people found other jobs. Uh, so I think the robot apocalypse, uh, it would be a good thing if it happened. Right. Because then we would have all these machines making very cheap goods and services, you know, for us uh, for, and we wouldn't have to work much because they would be so cheap. We just have to work a few hours. You wouldn't even need a universal basic income. And let me make one more point briefly about the universal basic income. Uh, it's it's a contradictory idea because mm -hmm. in many the idea is that you tax the owners of the robots in order to pay universal basic income to everybody. Okay, but if robots are so advanced, uh, then at that point they will be as common as microwaves or refrigerators, and they will be cheap. So these this will not be a profitable industry, right? It would be like having a universal basic income based on taxing companies that produce microwaves or refrigerators. There's not enough money there to support mm -hmm. people. So the idea I think is, it's, it's one of these fads that resurfaces every few years. And I'm not saying AI won't be important, but the steam engine was important and the electric battery was important. Uh, but we'll find enough jobs for human beings to do for generations to come. Right. Because in your book, you talked about at that time of FDR, when you looked at redistribution of wealth, they weren't talking about redistribution of wealth. They were talking about higher salaries. Again, where we started with the living wage. And if you're paying someone a wage that they can live on, raise a family on, take care of their children, take care of their parents, there we go. But the enemy of that, what what keeps these productivity gains from being realized by the workers, and correct me if I have this wrong, are things like offshoring and bringing in, increasing the supply of labor through immigration. Well, that's right. And it's even more sinister than that. Uh, you end up with a, a quarter or so of the population 
that cannot make ends meet on a wage alone and needs food stamps, the earned income tax credit, housing vouchers, and so on. So we end up having a two-tier workforce where the lower tier is the so-called working poor. Even if you work 40 hours a week, you're still poor and you would, would be destitute without means-tested government welfare programs. So we have a welfare state that effectively subsidizes the employers of cheap labor, that those employers know they don't have to pay a living wage. The rest of us won't let their underpaid workers starve. Uh, so they get to privatize the benefits of paying low wages and to uh, uh, socialize the costs. The rest of us have to pay for their underpaid workers. Uh, you see the same thing with discussions of trade. For example, uh -huh. uh, academic economists say, well, a few displaced factory workers are hurt severely, but all Americans benefit from lower prices. But think about that. That's simply false. So if you have sneaker uh, factory workers are laid off in the U.S. and replaced by sneaker imports from China, how do I benefit from that as a consumer in the United States if I don't buy imported sneakers? So you see the trick that the economists are doing. They're implying that all Americans benefit from all imports. And therefore, the uh, benefit, which is negligible for the most part, to 330 million American consumers outweighs the harm done uh, that just destroys the lives of, you know, a couple of million workers and of their communities as well. Wow. Uh, Peter, my final question to you today is this. Uh, let's just say you're pres not just president of the United States, but you have powers that will allow you to do what you feel needs to be done to put the country back on the right track. If there were three things you could do, what would they be? Oh, that's easy. Uh, replace our unilateral free trade system with a system of strategic trade, where in strategic industries, uh, which are important to national security and long-term productivity growth, manufacturing, rare earths, uh, some others, pharmaceutical supply chains. Uh, we simply have local content requirements. Any company in the world can make them, but they have to make them here uh, and hire American workers. And in some cases, now there, there are other things where we don't care. Okay, there, there's some raw materials, there's some, you know, manufacturing, you know, we can import them, that's fine. But you would have a division you know, between uh, protectionism for strategic industries uh, and uh, free trade for non-strategic industries. Uh, with regard to immigration, I would just follow this, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, just do what the Jordan Commission in the 90s and the Hesburgh Commission recommended. Keep a, a generous program for genuinely skilled immigrants. If we can get Albert Einstein and 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 uh, uh, you know these geniuses to come here, fine. Uh, radically cut back on all sources of unskilled immigration, including what's called family chain migration, where mm -hmm. one immigrant can then bring in a sibling and then it, it, you end up bringing you know a dozen people uh, and. Uh, uh, and while doing that, uh, you eliminate uh, all guest worker visas. Basically, the only people allowed to work in the U.S. are U.S. citizens and people with uh, green cards, with legal uh, permanent residence. That's it. Uh, if identical worker rights. The third thing I would do uh, is uh, I have various uh, uh, proposals for working for raising wages in different industries in my book, Hell to Pay. But the most crucial one is cleaning up a small number of really rancid industries uh, where most of the low wage jobs are. It's retail, it's leisure, mm -hmm. it's fast food, it's construction, it's janitorial, it's a few others. And the way to do that, again, it, it's, it's not rocket science, it, it, it's old fashioned. Uh, there's an institution called the Wage Board used in every English speaking country for a hundred years recently revived in California and in New York, where the governor or the mayor, you don't even have to do this at national level, you can do it at state or local level. Uh, you appoint representatives of all of the employers in a field and representatives of labor, and they set a minimum wage and scheduling and hours for those low wage workers. Uh, 
So you do those three things, strategic trade, restrict uh-huh. unskilled immigration, uh, and start out uh, on a long-term process of rebuilding worker power by using wage boards to clean up the really sleazy low-wage industries. Uh, and, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be on the way. Wonderful. Michael Lind, and the book is Hell to Pay, How Suppression of Wages is Destroying America. And absolutely buy this book. It, you, you so clearly delineate with, with numbers, uh, backing up everything you say. It's exhaustive. And for the reader, it's an amazing resource to have. And Michael, I, on behalf of my audience, and I want to thank you so much for joining me. This is amazingly insightful. Thank you for having me. Thank you.